law uh, under Theodosius II, the Trinity idea was uh, enforced by state law. And if you disagreed with it publicly, you were executed. That's why for over a thousand years there was no dissent, because people feared for their lives. I'm not exaggerating that, it's just a fact. That's the only reason the Trinity Doctrine gained its universal and consistent consistency for a millennium was because of the threat of death. Actually, the deity of the Holy Spirit is affirmed in the New Testament by the New Testament authors. And it is a, as, as the only fathers in believe I said there are followers, the there are people within the Christian dom, within the first few centuries, who didn't believe exactly what you believe. Now, if I were to talk about their followers, they would say, look, why doesn't the Quran represent my view? In fact, what the Quran does, what Allah does, is actually he refutes every single branch of Christianity. Let's see how it does. That. Ignatius of Antioch, another witness, Ignatius of Antioch, a very early father. We have uh, about seven uh, authentic letters of his, extant, Penguin Classics. Nowhere, when he talks about God, does he ever mention the doctrine of the Trinity? Actually, he never says... Actually, he, he does. Uh, oh, really? Uh, I, Wait, would you like to show me where? So let's return the to... The doctrine the of the Trinity, I'm taking that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you need so to we can talk about this. Come across it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Just, you just, you've, just, got, you've got the hymn that he made, that he quotes from. There's only one position, very flesh and spirit, to great and yet born. God and man in one he creates the whole thing. He affirms Christ as God there, and we have the Father as God. And then uh, just uh, we have a uh, depth stone joy, yes, stones of the Father's temple. So the red from God's build, Christ up with the dark of Jesus Christ, the cross of the Holy Spirit, for him. Doesn't mention the Trinity. Doesn't mention the Trinity. The Trinity doctrine is that there's one God. This one God consists of, or subsists of, three persons. The Father, who is fully God, the Son, who is fully God, the Holy Spirit, is fully God. He does not articulate that doctrine. But it does but articulate the, the deity of the Father and the Son, and distinguishes them. And it does mention the Holy Spirit in that no, no, that's not the, see, the, I, I chose my word very carefully, because I'm aware of the debate. I said that Ignatius of Antioch does not teach the doctrine of the Trinity. That's precisely what I said. I did not say that you could collate together from here, here, and put together in a doctrine that you have constructed, that you then say is Ignatius doctrine of the Trinity. That is a different exercise and a highly disputable one. I said he's not teach what Calvin teaches, what the uh, what Nicaea two teaches, what um, uh, Council of Constantinople one and two teach. Doesn't teach what any of the later prophets because no one did in the early years. No one taught the doctrine of the Trinity in the early centuries. I actually, I would argue that that's. Like Can you give me any, another example? Because uh, Justin Martyr says there are two powers in heaven, not three. The two are Jesus and the Father, the Son and the Father. And he does not say that God is three in one. Does so, the Bible say that? No, the Bible doesn't. I mean, it's a joke. Does the Bible it's a funny thing. That? The Bible doesn't say that either. So, 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 so we're arguing something that doesn't exist I, I, even I, I, in the Bible. I mean, I, I'm happy to disagree with you on that. Yeah. I know you don't agree, but the, the, this is a consensus of most scholars. They don't, it, it is well known. Uh, overwhelmingly, scholars recognise that the Trinity is not in the Old Testament, it's not taught by Jesus, it was not taught by the earliest disciples, it was not taught by Paul. Paul says the head of Christ is God. There is a hierarchy of God, Jesus, Do you accept man, the Paul woman. Of Sorry? Do you accept that Paul affirms that Christ is fully deity? Um, I'm asking a question about Paul believes in the truth. It doesn't. Um, yeah, but you did. But, uh, you, the question is not about you. You've been right. If, 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 if the Times affirms propositions which together form the Trinity, I think the reason why they are debated about Jesus never taught me. The key, the key point here is ultimately a commonality here. You believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, you believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. But the historical evidence suggests that nowhere did Jesus ever teach that God is three and one. It was your assertion that the doctrine of the Trinity was established at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. Um, could you please uh, respond to these statements made by Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch in AD 107, which is 218 uh, uh, years before that.
There is one physician of flesh and of spirit, generate and ingenerate, God in man, true life and death, both from Mary and from God, first passable and impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord, by the will of the Father and of Jesus Christ our God, for our God Jesus Christ, and finally, await the one who is above every season, the eternal, the invisible, the one who for our sake became visible, the untouched, the impassable, who for our sake suffered, who endured in every way for our sake. Could you please explain if the doctrine of the Trinity didn't come about till 325, why Ignatius could say these words in AD 107? Right? Exhorting obedience to Christ and to the Father and to the Spirit. Right? But this idea of the Trinity doctrine, it came over time. Look at that, 110 after Christ. And nobody knew about it. It's amazing. why Ignatius could say these words in A.D. 107. Um, could you please uh, respond to these statements made by Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, in A.D. 107? Ignatius is, we think, an early bishop. We don't really know much about him, except that there are some letters that purport to be from him. He's believed to have been martyred sometime between the year 98 and the year 117. So people have for a very long time been very interested in Ignatius because he's only, you know, one or two generations after the apostles. This is somebody who easily could have met the apostle John, for instance. The problem is that it has long been very controversial which, if any, letters attributed to Ignatius are really by him. A whole bunch of them have come down to us in manuscripts. I would say that the conservative mainstream position, a position that many Protestant and Catholic scholars would go for nowadays, for instance, if you look in the edition called the Apostolic Fathers, edited by Michael Holmes, You'll see this position in the introduction to the letters of Ignatius. The mainstream conservative position is that exactly seven of these letters are genuine. The problem is, even though seven letters come in three versions, there's a long one, a medium one, and a short one. The mainstream position is that seven of the letters in the medium length are genuine, or at least mostly so, maybe with some later corruptions. 
There is some scholarly consensus that the short version of the letters is just kind of an abridgment, a paraphrase that's been shortened down by somebody later on of the middle length letters. Okay, so if you want to know what the original letters said, the short ones are just leaving too much out because they seem to be an abridgment of the middle length letters. What about the much longer version? Scholars are pretty much universally agreed, and I agree as well, that the long version of the letters of Ignatius are from the 4th century. That is, somebody in the 4th century who became known to history as one of the, quote, Arians, a person with that type of theology, took the middle-length letters and stuffed them full of a bunch of other stuff to push it in a, quote, Arian direction. Scholars across the board now agree that this is how we got the long version of the letters. It's just the medium length ones larded up with a bunch of extra stuff, which is clearly from the fourth century. You would hope then that the middle length letters would be the genuine ones. Well, I wish it was that simple. When I read the middle length letters and some scholars agree, but there's not really a consensus about this. When I read the middle length letters, I see some things that sound like they're from the early second century which is when these are supposed to be from. But I also read things that sound like later Monarchian theology. I see terminology and issues that really arose, particularly in the early 200s. So I think that even the middle-length letters have been heavily corrupted. I guess I think that there probably are some genuine parts there, but there's no way to really separate things out. Right, so we're talking about a difference here of perhaps 100 years, difference between something written around the year 100 and something written around the year 200, or maybe somewhat later than that. It's not that hard to discern these later elements. Imagine that you're reading something that's supposed to be a letter from a soldier who served in World War I, right, 1914 to 1918. In the middle of this letter, he mentions cybercrime. Well, hold on a second, Buster. Cybercrime? That term was invented in the 1990s. That just can't be right. If this is a genuine letter and not a complete forgery, then somebody has added in this part that mentions cybercrime in a letter from 1918. So it's harder when you get farther on in history than we are from 1918 and from the 90s, but still it can be done. And there are some scholars, a minority, who think that these letters were just wholly forged later on. I think there's probably a genuine core there. Okay, so this is the huge headache that's been caused by this, frankly, evil Christian habit of forging letters to try to support their theological position, which was just rampant in the ancient world. We need to read the footnotes. We need to read the introductions that scholars give us to these books so that we can know when we're dealing with fakes or with genuine but heavily corrupted sources that we have to be very careful with. So let's stick to sources that are plausibly from the second century. What about the seven letters of Ignatius? Well, in those seven letters, if they're genuine, and again, I, I guess I think that at least some of them are genuine, although I also think they've been corrupted at least once, probably in the late 100s or sometime in the 200s. Really, I think we have to be skeptical about those letters. They seem to pointedly call Jesus God and our God. Again, that's a later habit that just wasn't done around the turn of the second century. You do see it, of course, all over the third century and beyond. Here's a more interesting source. This is the letter called First Clement, which scholars date to perhaps around the year 95. And really, First Clement sounds very much like the New Testament in most ways. The Creator there and the one God there is the Father. Jesus is repeatedly called his servant and is described as our high priest. The book of First Clement never says that Jesus is divine, never says that he has divine nature and human nature, and it never says that he existed before his conception. None of these Christological claims are either explicitly said or implied, or suggested, or even presupposed by anything that's in that book. Again, in this book, it's just God that is the Father himself who's the creator. 
In fact, that was always the emphasis in Christian literature until a certain point in Christian history. 